<laughs> Look who's there. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Rosensweet. Good morning, Good morning Carol. Carol. It is nice to see you. Famous words. Welcome, 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 everybody, <laughs> to our Facebook Live with our questions that are always answered so eloquently and delightfully. One thing I want to say, other than that wonderful thing, um, we will not be here on Thursday, and I did put that up onto uh, the ins and outs group, and there's a good reason for that. I don't know if I'm allowed totally to say why. Chomping at the bit, <laughs> I am. But, right. Whatever. So we're just going to get started. <laughs> How's that? Question number one. Welcome, ladies. Welcome, men. Good morning. Okay. So to me, this was interesting. Uh, has anyone ever switched from patches to oils? The equivalent, uh, this woman has been told, um, and she's referring to estradiol, is apparently almost five times as much in the oils than my patches. And I'm really nervous about this as I've had um, really bad prior uh, experiences um, in regards to too much uh, estradiol. And that's the question. Great, Great question. question. Um, um, we got an echo. You might, you might have, have to. to. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, but see, we, we lost, lost your, your image. image. And we still have so, the echo. Weird. Hang on. <laughs> the um, that's good. The that's a good question. Um, yes, it just with me alone, hundreds of women have converted from the patch to the oils. And the patch has unusual math associated with it. Like when you're talking about compounded bioidentical hormones and even pharmaceutical manufactured hormones that are applied to the skin, the way they're languaged is in milligrams applied to the skin or you know or if they're just talking about the formulation that comes milligrams per milliliter and then it really matters how much it milliliters is delivered how much so the milligrams per milliliter or the milligrams applied that's what it refers to is how many milligrams of estrogens for example do you actually apply to the skin that's not the language of the patch. The patch has come up with this very unusual thing. I, it confounds me on how they've ever come up with it. They talk about the amount of hormone delivered. So when you talk about strengths of patches, there's the 0 0.05 milligram patch otherwise known as the 50 microgram patch, which is 0 0.05 milligrams. Whereas in any topical, you're talking about a milligram applied. That's not 0 0.05 milligrams. That, that would be the patch language. That's a milligram. That would be 20 times as much. You're frozen. I can't hear you. Oh, really? Ah, there you go. All right, okay. we're good. So when the questioner says she's really frightened because it looks like such so much higher doses are used with the oils or any gel or cream, it's not real. There's a scientific glitch there. It requires understanding this very unusual way of referring to patch strength as dose delivered. So you can forget about the math. Thank now, you. we do have available to our menopause method providers a calculator that you plug in the patch that you are on and it translates it into the milligrams per milliliter of biased 
patch is pure estradiol. We don't believe in pure estradiol. <laughs> it's the only thing you have. It's great. But we have, we, we have, we're strong believers in estriol. And you can read all about it in the latest edition of the seventh edition now of Happy Healthy Hormones for Women. And uh, so <clears throat> some healthcare provider plugs in the patch dose that's being used and out comes the prescription for the milligrams per milliliter of bias in oil and the number of drops. That's one way to do it, the mathematical equivalence. Now, periodically throughout many, many years, when I first designed the first calculator to calculate when someone was on a cream or a gel and we wanted to convert to the oils, it's fun the, the, to set up a spreadsheet that does that, thus a calculator, it's fun. Especially <laughs> since I won half of the Berkeley High School math cup. I wasn't given the whole cup. I had to share it with my friend, but it's still an honor. I'd say, cause boy. <laughs> Berkeley High School. <laughs> so. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> so it translated into loving spreadsheets and loving calculators, and I'm, I'm way into those kind of things. But when I first did that, probably 15 years ago, my first calculator, I did it for a while, and then I realized, yeah, you can come up with the exact math, but absorptions are different. Better to start from scratch. So the whole other way of addressing the patch is once you have the bottle of bias in your hand, and you could start with 30 milligrams per milliliter, 80-20. One drop is equivalent to 0 0.44 milligrams of potency of estradiol. You can start with one drop in the morning and one drop in the evening, take off the patch, and the next day, start the oils. One drop in the morning and one drop in the evening. For most women, it's going to work just fine. So there's two ways to approach conversion from the patch to oils or creams, for that matter, is do the math and come up with the exact formulation of the bias equivalent to the patch that you're on and start right there at the exact amount or receive the prescription of bias 30 milligrams per milliliter 80 20 eight and a half milliliters and once you got the bottle in your hand remove the patch and the next day start with one drop in the morning and one drop in the evening and keep on increasing according to a schedule that Carolyn, you have posted before and it also exists within the book. So you're gradually increasing, um, be, you know, with certainty to alleviate symptoms of insufficiency that you might have, like hot flashes. While if you get into symptoms of excess, you stop increasing and you back down. Symptom of excess with estrogen is breast tenderness, for example. So there's the two ways of doing it. Do the math and this this calculator is available to any healthcare provider. Thank God for calculators because, oh, oh, oh. yeah, I mean, that's or funny. start from scratch. Get the prescription of thirty milligrams per milliliter, eighty twenty, <clears throat> and um, remove the patch. And the next day, start up on the oils. And and so you're starting from scratch to find out the optimal dose for yourself. Right. What I can extrapolate, sort of, uh, if that's the right word, even from this question, it would, the way I would think of it, she may not at all. She might totally get this. For me, I would be like, oh my God, if I do that, then I'm going to be taking 25 times uh, right. as much estradiol. You know, like that's, huh? You know, kind and, of. And, and great that you're bringing us back to that because the questioner has got to totally erase from her mind the math because it doesn't work because throughout the world of hormones 
that are applied topically to the body, or for that matter, even other methods, you, you all, it's always language in ter terms of dose applied or dose swallowed or trochy dose that you're trochy. <laughs> or, and so thus milligrams that you swallow or milligrams in your trochy or milligrams that you apply to your skin. Forget it with the patch. It's not language like that. It's really calculated through mechanisms that I have never understood how they did it, how they arrived at it. But dose delivered, which means what shows up in the blood. So when you're converting from the patch, there is no way to give an exact equivalent. I've done it because I've compared 24 year urine hormone tests and women are in the patch. and. So I've come up with a scheme to uh, come up with the math of, of conversion. But to the questioner, you're, you're not correct. When you think you're taking 50 or 20 times as much, that's not correct. Because the system of evaluating dosage for the patch is entirely different than the whole <laughs> universe of dosing of hormones or penicillin or anything. It's totally different. Right. It's like apples and oranges, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It took me a long time to understand that, but I am still learning <laughs> the math, and I don't want to learn the math because I don't much like math. <laughs> However, it's important, and um, I would I can see where that would be absolutely terrifying, you know. But it, it shouldn't be. It's only because there's a total lack of understanding of mm -hmm. what's going on there. And it's not a big deal clinically. I mean, when doctors prescribe the patch, they take a guess at what would be a good starting dose of the patch, and they may be spot on. Or they may have to increase to the next dosage of patch or the next dosage of patch if symptoms aren't alleviated. They can gradually increase or decrease the strength of the patch because the patch comes in, I'm not remembering exactly, but at least five different dosages. So in, for someone who understands the process, it's not hard at all. It's really easy. You just guess at that starting patch. And if, you need, if you're not alleviating all symptoms of estrogen deficiency, you'll, the next time out, you'll prescribe a higher potency patch. And the same goes for the oils or gels or creams. You're going to come up with a starting dosage and you're going to gradually increase the dose and so I don't want it to sound complex because it's not. It's really right. Right. Yeah, she's it's very, very sensitive. To understand it. And it probably points out this fundamental issue that the I'm going to make a wild guess that the questioner wasn't able to discuss these kind of things with her health care provider. Because up close and in person, a health care provider who was very savvy and experienced and knowledgeable about treating women with hormones would have said, oh, no, this is no problem at all. You can, it's just a different mathematical language that's used with the patch. Don't be concerned. You are on this patch. That's a very common dose. We're going to switch you over to the common dose of oils because they're very, you know, it's and, and then you'll dial in with a little more precision once we switch you over, but it's really easy. Cool. Well, we like easy. <laughs> easy works. <laughs> and we also like feeling well. So it's a double win-win. Double win-win. So that's a big one. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, it's interesting because uh, there were some answers given that were very close to what you just said. And I was like, wow. That, wow. Anyway, so yeah, thanks for that. Okay, moving on to um, my number two question, which has to do with what we've discussed before, but it's big, and I get a lot of questions about this. If we test and we have these things. Can I interrupt you for just a moment? Sure. I, th I think it might be helpful to just know that a women have a wide range of the amount of estrogen they need, for example. Mm -hmm. Some women don't need very much, and they're going to be perfectly healthy and can do everything we want. 
Other women have a much bigger requirement. There's a wide range there. In fact, this upper limit is about three times what the lower limit is. And there is an average. And the average in my practice is when we're using the oils is 1.7 milligrams of estradiol equivalent a day. It's equivalent to the potency of 1.7 milligrams of estradiol applied. And that's equivalent to the 0 0.05 patch or the 50 microgram patch. So there's the, there's the math there. And you can work up and down um, just by that equivalency. Now, having said that, and what that translates to in, in, in oils language is you prescribe a bias 30 milligrams per milliliter, 80-20, and you do two drops in the morning and three drops in the evening, and you got the patch. <laughs> right. Mathematically, <laughs> right. you got the patch. <laughs> that does not mean because of absorption differences and individual differences that it's going to translate perfectly. That's why I often recommend, let's just start from scratch. We'll give you the same, uh, we'll give you the same prescription, 30 milligrams per milliliter, 80, 20, and you'll, you'll start low and you'll gradually increase. And we'll see what was equivalent clinically to your patch. But there's the equivalency. Yeah, that word equivalent. As the calculator, you can plug in other patch dosages because there's a 0 0.075, there's a 0 0.1, there's a 0 0.025. All of these can be plugged into a calculator, but it's just ratios, just math, just spreadsheets. Thank you, God, someone's doing them and has a, has a clue <laughs> because, you know, these are real questions and they're real fears and, you, you know, we've we've talked about I, like the I appreciate the question yeah yeah absolutely and our minds can kind of take us there <laughs> to saber tooth tiger land <laughs> you know what i mean um good morning lisa um i want to move on to this question if i may um because it has to do with xenoestrogens uh, that we have in us um the question is if we test and we do have xenoestrogens in us, will this show on the test? Will the mimickers show up? This is so confusing to me, she says. How do we know what is real and what is not real? Like what's a real hormone? What's a mimicker? Um, does it show in the receptor of the cell? Does it not? What, you know, it's very confusing to her. I think you understand the question, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Now, here's a wild proposition that we put that question on hold and uh, answer Liza's question. I think that we can do that. That one on the patch. Sure. And, uh, hi, Antoinette, our most frequent flyer. I know, huh? <laughs> and Liza. So would you read Liza's question? Indeed, yeah. I will. Um, good morning, and good morning to you, too. I am on 0.75 milligrams estradiol patch estradiol patch, I'm sorry, um, and was feeling great until recently when added in 100 milligram pill of progesterone at night. Since adding progesterone, it feels like it's canceling all the helpful effects of the patch. Hot flashes are back, super tired, etc. And why is this? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Actually, just because we're going to deal with actual pat, patch language, it happens to be 0 0.075 would be the correct language, 75 microgram patch. And um, I think the great news is, Lisa, is that you were feeling great on that patch. Mm -hmm. And one thing I love about that is we now have scientific proof about you that you can replenish estrogen, estradiol in this case, and you can feel great. We don't know that until it actually happens. We got the theory that if we replenish hormones, a woman's going to feel a lot better. But now we know that your body knows how to put together the physiology and the recipe of feeling better. So we want to celebrate that. I really don't have a great idea of why the 100 milligram progesterone threw you off. Now, 
it's this is not my preferred way of treating women in menopause so i'm reaching into a world that i let go of a long time ago like mm. 28 years ago <laughs> when i was born <laughs> because <laughs> yeah when i when Sorry. you were born um florida because <laughs> i didn't i thought there was much better um, tools available and yesterday i'll patch although if it was the only tool i had i would celebrate it because you get to replenish one of the three estrogens in a woman and you can do great work with it but gosh i love the topical daily twice daily applied estrogen i like the form called bias that's 80 percent in most instances not in all instances estriol which is a deep proliferative, thus protective estrogen. So um, I'm not used to having a woman on a patch, nor am I used to starting with a 100 milligram pill of progesterone. Something went wrong. Let me show you how we do it. We simultaneously uh, uh, prescribe three bottles of hormones, ovarian hormones. One of them is a combination of testosterone and DHEA. Most women need that. Not every woman in the perimenopause or early menopause needs that, but it's so common that we always ship the first shipment of all three bottles. One of the bottles is the bias, that's the estrogen. You're dealing with that with the patch. We prefer bias and we have a formulation, a formula in order for you to determine the optimal dose for you, we start low, we gradually increase, we gradually increase the dosages all along the way. We'll alleviate the symptoms you're having, like you had hot flashes. So when the hot flashes go away, we must be entering the ballpark of what's the right bias dose for you. Now, we always start off with topical progesterone. And we start off at, we simultaneously always start off with biased and progesterone always and we're not starting out with the, the pills we're starting out with the topical because there's a certain percentage of women that'll do just great when they apply progesterone in a form to their skin as well now occasionally or you know not even even more than occasionally we will switch to the oral progesterone but I never start with 100 milligrams. We issue two bottles of progesterone capsules, long acting, to women. They're prepared by compounding pharmacists. One of those bottles is a 25 milligram bottle, and there's 30 capsules in there. And another uh, bottle is 75 milligram capsules, and there's 60 of them in there. And we start the woman off usually on 50 milligrams, sometimes on 25 milligrams, thus either two or one of the 25 milligram capsules. And we do that for three nights. So you see, we're starting at a different dose. We don't start at 75 milligrams. We're starting at 50 max. And sometimes we even start at 75. I'm sorry, excuse me. Sometimes we even start at 25. And then a woman goes three nights, and if she doesn't show symptoms of overdose of progesterone, i.e. waking up groggy the next morning because you take the progesterone at night to help her sleep. So if she started at 50 milligrams and she goes three nights and she's not waking up groggy the next morning, for the next three nights we'll have her take one of the 75 milligram capsules. So we're going from 50 milligrams to 75 milligrams. And sometimes we go from 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams, to 75 milligrams. And we gradually increase in that way so that a woman finds her optimal dose. I'm not saying that the 100 milligram capsule progesterone that you're taking is the wrong dose, but something's wrong. Yeah. And they're not canceling each other out, but some, if the 100 milligrams is an excessive dose, it can interfere with just enough of the function of the estrogen that 
when you're on estrogen alone, it beautifully eliminated the hot flashes. But when you got on a dose that was too high of progesterone, the estrogen, some of the estrogen didn't work as well. So you're winding up on not enough estrogen. That can happen. But I don't know that that's the total explanation. But again, you're working in a world that's not my preferred world. Um, we're, use, we're, we're using topicals. But I'm not trying to diminish, you know, again, if, if the patch and Prometrium, because you're taking Prometrium, 100 milligram, if that was the only tools I'd have, I'd celebrate it. That 0 0.075 is a pretty robust patch. So um, once again, Liza, back to the drawing board with you, but celebrate that you have living proof that you can get a lot of great work done on that patch. And now it's just dialing in the proper dosage of the patch and the proper dosage of the progesterone. Wow. <laughs> okay. It's a lot of moving parts, as you say. There really are a lot of moving parts. And I know that you say it's not complicated. Um, getting into the world of canceling out, you know, having progesterone yeah. possibly. There's something not quite right. And I, again, Eliza has the celebration that, uh, that, 0 0.075 patch did a lot of good. Mm -hmm. There is hope, Liza. We are expanding our uh, number of providers rather dramatically here. And if you stay in touch with Sherry, you, 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 get, you get on Sherry's list by contacting us. You know, sooner or later, we're, we're going to find someone in your area. Or I'm also always happy to, do, to t speak directly with your prescribing provider if they want to convert you to the oils, because the oils can be purchased in any state. They can be prescribed in any state in the United States. So if you're, if you want to, if you like your provider and they're willing to talk to me, uh, I, we can help them get into the oils really easily. That's the way to do it, Liza. And now Carolyn, to that preceding question about the xenoestrogens. Oh yeah, those things. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what xenoestrogens are is they're fake estrogens. They're chemicals that happen to behave in the human body as if they were estrogens. And weirdly enough, dinosaurs, when introduced to the human body, act like estrogens. Well, <laughs> to make it a little more understandable, <laughs> in other words <laughs> in other words i guess one of the major sources of petroleum was dinosaurs that I'm is sure of that. <laughs> and petroleum products oh my god of all the things they could behave like in the human body they don't belong in the human body not at all they're too toxic, petroleum, gasoline, kerosene, and the zillions of other petroleum product dinosaur derivatives. They don't belong in the human body at all. Not one molecule of them, no matter what form they're in, alcohol, none of them, they don't belong there. Alcohol is the mildest, but you get into some of the other stuff and like, like the food additives, the herbicides, the pesticides, these things are derived from petroleum, a lot of them. And they're very strong chemicals. And, you know, when you get exposed to insecticides or some of your household products, some of these strong cleaning products that have these strong odors, these some of these are, are petroleum derived or similar to petroleum. And how do these chemicals that have no business being on your skin or on your hair, parabens, all the, you take a look at your label of your shampoo. There's some chemicals in there that you can't even pronounce. It's, and they're this long, these words. And right. they're teeny, tiny. They, and, and, you know, so many of these chemicals that are in your dishwashing, your laundry stuff, and your dry cleaning stuff, and if you have some of these fragrance emitters, all these things 
these are strong chemicals. And what of all the things that they could do in the human body, why don't they just behave like diuretics, for example, and make your right. team? No, they don't. They don't behave like diuretics. They get into the estrogen receptors and they bung up the estrogen receptors. And they can even have estrogen-like effects. Weirdest thing. And that's what xenoestrogen means. It's chemicals that have no business in the female or male body. These xenoestrogens are so pervasive, they're, they wound up in the water supply in Florida, for example. Or shall I say all over the world. Yeah. Mostly, certainly in industrialized countries. And what they did in Florida is they reduced the sperm count of the alligators so the alligators don't reproduce. And, you know, male, human male sperm counts in the United States are way reduced from when I was in medical school. These is a lot because of these chemicals. So in anyone who wants to heal, we get a rough evaluation of what kind of chemical exposures you have. Like I have, for example, a couple of patients who are landscape artists. They're, they're doing landscaping. Well, they've been ex exposed to a lot of herbicides and pesticides over the course of their career, and they got some funky metabolic processing of their hormones. We see it on the 24-hour urine. Like, what's not going right there? So these, these things, and I just got back from a wonderful environmental medicine conference in Tucson. And, you know, this is state of the art. These are the, the world experts on environmental toxins. And, oh, my God. Now, I've heard this for 50 years. So it wasn't news to me, but it's as more appalling than ever before, the consequences of this and the consequences to the immune system, for example, and thus its relationship to insufficient immunity to deal with the various critters and viruses and germs that we're having to deal with these days. So back to xenoestrogens. Yeah, a lot of these chemicals behave like estrogens. And so how do you find out? Well, there is laboratories. If you go to a functional medicine doctor or nurse practitioner or health coach, they're going to be familiar with these laboratories that do toxic analyses. And one of the things that they can do is these petroleum based products, the, the long list of chemicals and you submit a urine sample and they see what's, what's coming out of your body. That's what's in your body. Yeah. And you can get an assessment of how much of a toxic, internal burden do you actually have and in the and is it important for you to get take on a major project called detoxifying yeah and you know for all of us like like i have a portable sauna it costs 350 dollars why did i why did i spend that money because i know i've got toxic exposure and i like to jump in that sauna and sweat one of a, a dear pathologist and, and pioneer in functional medicine, Russell Jaffe, talked about, his medical doctor, he talked about taking a radiator and sticking it in a closet or a bathroom and heating it up to 104 degrees. For one thing, that'll make you sweat. And for another thing, that's a good temperature for these toxic solvents that are in your body to volatilize and come out of your body. So you don't need a $350. You just need to heat up your closet or your bathroom and lay down and enjoy yourself and sweat <laughs> and do it frequently. And you're going to get rid of some of this stuff. Right. And, you know, all of this xenobiotic subject matter begins with what is true for all toxic exposure is do a very deep cleanse of your house. And you'll be surprised, you can be surprised about how many toxic products you got there. So I've been very careful on my shampoo and our soaps, dish soap, my body soap. And outside of that, I love distilled white vinegar and water as a cleaner. And just think of the money you'll save. <laughs> 
you don't have to buy these 50 products that you, you cram into your bathroom cabinet and you're under your sink in your kitchen. You don't need them. They're not good for you. So no, the first air thing, product. Yeah, so much stuff. Sometimes Ooh. when we're working with women and we're replenishing hormones in perimenopause or menopause, we notice things aren't going as well. And they're not following the rules. And we start suspecting what's going on here. How come this woman isn't, this isn't going as well as we like. And when we do a 24 hour urine, sometimes we'll see these unusual biochemical processing of the hormones in ways that are unfavorable and not healthy and don't really copy nature of how a young woman biochemically processes her estrogens, for example. And when we see stuff like this, I go, hmm, <laughs> not detoxifying properly. What's going on here? Is it because their liver is not doing so well? And when the liver is not doing so well, the very first thing I look at is the intestinal tract. So these are wonderful healing programs to get involved in sooner and later in your life anyway, because we've all overburdened our intestinal tract and our liver. And there's relatively simple measures we can take to heal a dysfunctional dysbiotic intestinal tract or a liver that's not functioning fully up to par. And then it's getting the xenoestrogens out of there. You can test for the xenoestrogens, but when I see things like improper m metabolism, I go, why don't we just go for the cure? She's probably got too much toxic in her. She's probably challenged her liver too much. Why don't we just detoxify? So you go through your house with a fine tooth comb and get rid of everything that doesn't spell isn't spelled by the word vinegar <laughs> and check out your shampoos and and you know there's books written on this it's such an easy process it's just like go back to 200 years ago what could you buy vinegar you can't buy all this stuff don't so don't buy it or get rid of it and then do some detoxification and sweating is a great detoxifier just for openers. But you may have to address your liver and your gut too. So Indeed. xenoestrogens translate into causing trouble, but don't get bent out of shape about it. If you're walking and talking and able to work and do your take care of your family and do your dishes, even though you may not be functioning like a, a vibrant 20 year old, you got a lot of good stuff going for you. So integrate projects. Integrate, that's a great projects. word. Into your life and each one of a new project. Like I've got <clears throat> two things that I've been doing for the last month, <clears throat> two new additions to my healing process. And they're small things, but you know, to actually integrate something into your life, and actually deploy it, implement it, that's a piece of work. So you can integrate detoxification into your life, whatever stage you're at. You might get, you might be at the get a shovel and get rid of all that crap in your house. That's a great way to start detoxifying. Well, the, next, <laughs> the next choice might be, uh oh, here's a big one. Purchasing only organic food because hopefully it does not have the herbicides and the pesticides. Right. That's a big one and it's a great one. And may, maybe it takes you a year or two to do that. And well. To get, to get, but you do it. And this is how we take on these projects. So if you're walking and talking, don't get bent out of shape by xenoestrogens. Just well, take yeah. The, take, this, take the baby steps it takes to, um, get yourself so that five years from now, 10 years from now, 
You've done a lot of great stuff, including detoxification. Because how do you heal? You clean up your nutrition. You get into a good exercise program that's not too little and not too much. You detoxify. And you uh, acquire information and tools to deal with the how you're responding to the stress of life. So right. Basic. That, so, so instead of getting bent out of shape by xenoestrogens, go to the basics, find your highest priorities, take one of those priorities on. Maybe it's, oh, this is the year I'm going to convert from non-organic food to organic food. That's going to help you detoxify. Oh, this is the year I'm going to clean out my bathroom sink, my bathroom cupboard, and my kitchen cupboard. So you take on one project at a time. And then if you're in menopause and you need to uh, replenish hormones, which you do if you're in menopause, then you get up with someone who really knows what they're doing. And so many physicians who have embraced treating women in menopause with compounded bioidentical hormones are basically functional medicine providers. Yes. So they're going to take into account Because, uh, sorry. Because healing is possible. Mm -hmm. So if you get someone, I'm repeating myself. If you're if replenishing hormones is important, even if you have xenoestrogens or you don't, choose someone who's treating women in menopause with compounded bioidentical hormones. And the high likelihood is they're going to have a small, medium, or huge education in functional medicine and they understand these issues and they understand the liver and how to help the liver. They understand how to help the gut. And you know, so it'll just be integrated into your healing process, which will take place over time. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. The body's really amazing too. And um, it does open up a whole new world of, well, just amazingness. I, I know you've been doing this for, for a long time and you've always been a holistic doctor um, <clears throat> taking on those projects actually can be fun and um, certainly helpful and then I guess you don't have to worry about any of that showing up on a on a 24-hour urine you know all the xenoestrogens and well, show up on the 24-hour urine the xenoestrogens the toxic chemicals, and there's a long list of them, they can be tested for. Functional medicine providers know the laboratories, or they should, and that you can send in body fluid samples, such as your urine, to these laboratories, and they're going to send you a readout of a long list of chemicals and whether you got them or not. Right. And that, boy, yeah, yeah, that's the answer right there. It's fabulous. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, that's a good you thing. To assess whether you have a small, medium, or large toxic chemical detoxification, xenoestrogen detoxification project to do, or whether you don't, whether, ooh, the trouble you were having with getting your hormones balanced properly had different origins than the xenoestrogens or than the toxic chemicals. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. That one, that one, I could go on forever on that whole subject. But then again, I'm kind of studying that stuff right now. <laughs> and it's really fascinating. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, moving on. Oh, good time. Um, this woman writes in, uh, she says, I'm very confused about compounding labels. Um, my prescription reads C slash E2, 0 0.25 milligrams per milliliter with instructions to use four clicks. So I'm imagining that means it's a cream. And how does this compare, back to our other question, to one milligram of oral estrogen? I have stopped taking that. So my question is, is the 0.25 milligrams of cream more potent than the one milligram of the oral 
estrogen I was taking. Apples and oranges. Again, right? When uh, one, mil one milligram is a common oral dose, and you're wise to switch off of oral estrogen. Oral estrogen has special risk factors that we don't need to do because the topicals work so great. So you're working towards, you're working with the topicals. When you say one milligram and you're swallowing it, 80 to 90% of what you swallow never makes it to your body. It gets immediately metabolized in the liver. So you can't, it's a, it's a ballpark guideline, but you can't do the math to immediately translate it into topicals. And they're not equivalent. And even when you read a topical milligram, not all of that is absorbed into your bloodstream. So these are rough guidelines. You froze again. Oh, oh. Hey ladies, you have me. Let's hope that Dr. R makes his way back. He will, he always does. Um, for those of you, um, while he's making his way back, please remember we're not going to be doing this um, on Thursday because he will be out of town, but we will resume on um, Tuesday, and I'm sure hoping that he comes back up because I really don't know what to talk about. <laughs> so soon enough, we'll see if Dr. R makes his way back to us. I may have to leave this page and see if I can go back to his other link. I'm not sure. So hang in there, and I'm going to do the same, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and we'll get that question answered. So uh, I'll give it a couple more, more seconds and see if he reappears. Otherwise, it might be a wrap. And that'll be a bummer. Aw, thank you, Sal. It's kind of like these weird uh, menopause uh, Facebook Live bloopers that happen. <laughs> and they do. Yeah. Um, waking is so confusing on bioidentical. Yeah, it is. Uh, for me, but I'm not the doctor, you know, um, I'm learning about all that. It's fascinating. Um, sometimes waking can be like a protective device in a weird way. Um, yeah, I think what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to sign out and re-sign in and see if I can find Dr. R, come back up on YouTube or take a look. I'm, I will post this on the, uh, on the group. Oh, there he is. We're back. I was having a wonderful conversation with myself. It was great. <laughs> so to pick up where I was, um, yes, where was I? Where you were is we were talking about um, apples and oranges, basically, with the one milligram. Uh, yeah, oral, yeah, oral estrogen. Yeah. It's great that you're making the switch. You're making a switch to a formula that's well constructed. So there's various ways you can approach it. I would follow, I would, uh, follow the guidelines of your provider. Um, 0 0.25 milligrams of estradiol per click is a great start. And I don't know if you were told to start with two clicks a day, one in the morning and one in the night. I, that's what I would recommend. And then every five days or so, increase by one click. Always increase the evening click first so that you, your next step would be one click in the morning and two clicks in the evening. And gradually increase like that over a series of over a course of weeks. And uh, that'll get you right into your right dose by alleviating symptoms of insufficiency while backing down from or uh, stabilizing when you get symptoms of excess. We describe all this in the book. 
that you can download from Carolyn's Facebook page. So, is Esther Dow my, my favorite? No. My favorite has got two differences to it. Um, the estrogen that you would use has 80% estriol and 20% estradiol. That would be my favorite. And then my favorite is uh, dispensing those in organic oils because that toppy click has solvents in it. But if, if that toppy click was the only tool. Oh, no. Dr. R, don't freeze. Come back. Yikes. <laughs> well, here I am again talking to myself. Um, and all of you, Dr. R will be back. 7.54. We have a few more minutes to go. My best guess is he's going to have a hard stop, as he usually does, and we'll be gone. So um, here we sit. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, yeah, we'll be able to get to, uh, I can't believe that we've gotten through all the questions. Um, I have one more left for you guys. In the event, he'll, he'll make his way back. Uh, it's a little awkward to just sit here looking at me. Um, however, worse things have happened, <laughs> I suppose. <sighs> Are we back? We're back. Okay. So I think I left off with, you've got a good tool there. And Increasing. follow instructions to your provider. And uh, you don't have to be concerned about the translation from one milligram of oral estrogen I, th I say a good choice was made by your prescriber and use that tool. Yeah, apparently, uh, well, cool. Yeah, I mean, that, that absolutely did answer the question. It did. Um, Don't be surprised if it doesn't take a lot. Like the women in our practice, they do, they do, they have a variable amount really works for them. At the low end, there's some women who can use 0 0.8 milligrams of estradiol equivalent, and that really satisfies them and gets the job done. That's the low end. The high end is 2.6. So the low end would be satisfied just about right by three clicks of what you got. Or you may need four clicks. The high end would be a lot more. Uh, it would take eight, nine, ten clicks uh, to get... Uh, if you happen to be a woman who had much greater need, but it doesn't matter. You're in a time when you're trying to find out what is the proper dose for you. <clears throat> we give very specific guidelines on how to do this in the book. And um, if you're using too many clicks, the next prescription, they can just increase the strength from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 or even one, you know, you can, there's a lot of room to play there when you're dealing with compounders. You can a uh, provider can do an infinite number of dosages. That's the great advantage of compounding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that you know, that's a whole other a whole other interview to talk about at some point too. Our compound wonderful compounding pharmacists and the work that they do for all of us. Um, let me ask this. And uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm 61, she says. Um, I've had some endometriosis. I believe that she had a full uh, hysterectomy and oophorectomy, the whole, whole nine. Um, is an RN, um, was told she did not need progesterone. She was put on the oral E uh, estrogen. Um, several years later, she then Hi, Jan. She then went to um, the estrogen patch, but she began having really, would you like to use, raucous <laughs> symptoms. And um, her whole thing is um, that uh, an NP, she uh, ran across 
um, suggested CBHRT, compounded bioidentical hormones, and um, she began the pellets. Um, and she also started the oral progesterone, and she felt great until she started to get really a little bit, what I think the word is wary of um, pellets. And she was wondering what your thoughts are in regards to that. Well, this is a common story and it's one that our group is really trying to make a difference about. When you go to orthopedic surgeons, you could go to a thousand of them and you're not going to wind up with 8,200 methods. There's going to be some standard of care methods and they're all going to know them and there's going to be the common methods and they're going to be the ones that most all of them choose. And there's not hundreds of variations within that. Same with go to an internal medicine diabetes doctor, go to deal with hypertension. There's going to be standard toolbox there and almost everyone in the field is going to choose from that toolbox. This is not true in the world of compounding. This is not true in the world of treating women in menopause. There's all kinds of approaches and we have strong opinions about what we feel are the best approaches and pellets is not one of them. It's so, to me, it's so anti-physiologic. You know, you insert a pellet, you, that day is your highest dose and you put enough for three months in there and they gradually decline. And, you know, sometimes when high doses of testosterone are implanted, for example, someone gets, feels high, they feel great, but they're really on too much dosage and there's consequence of too much dosage. So I'm not going to go in. I, I'm, I'm sure there's pellet uh, providers who would really like to argue with me on this or discuss this with me and have a strongly different opinion. And I, that there's probably pellet uh, knowledgeable and experienced providers that really have a lot of experience and they figured it out and they figured out how to make pellets right dose and safe. But that's not what I run into. Um, we run into a lot of pellet failures where women felt great in the beginning and then they de gradually didn't feel great and the body had gotten used to high doses. So I'm not a fan of pellets. So I would back yourself up to one of those other methods, but it looks to me like you, you're, 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 the job that you need to do is find a method that you're comfortable with. So you might have to do some educating. So I'd, re I'd read that book of ours, Happy Healthy Hormones. Absolutely. For no charge um, on, on Carolyn's Facebook page and go out shopping and get uh, and find, and you're, that's your main job. It's to find a healthcare provider who's doing topical estrogen and topical testosterone, minimal compounded hormones. And if you got someone who's got an education in that and has got some experience in that, that's your main job because you're moving from a provider and method to method. And I think the, you would do best with a topically applied estrogen and testosterone and uh, sometimes topical progesterone is just the perfect thing as well. And then also prescribing DHEA and maybe even thyroid. But you want to start there, find a provider that is prescribing topical compounded bioidentical estrogens, preferably in the form of biased testosterone, progesterone, and DHEA. And if they're doing that, they've had, they've been educated in that, and they might even have some significant experience in that. Um, that's what I would recommend is the best next step for you. Yeah, and she's ahead of the game too in that regard, but you know, just by taking what she did and being an RN and really I think that who knows, I mean, I you know, the question was asked, I guess, because she she had some yeah, concern. So, so you got you're back to you're back to square zero from my perspective, as you're not gonna hear about from me uh any anything around uh any excitement around the pellets, no way. I feel like in most hands, they're not okay. So there, there, there we go. Have it. Up and I've got a hard stop. So I'm going to say until a week from today, because we're not going to be, uh, I'm traveling to a conference on Thursday. Well, how about that? 
Yay. All righty. So you know what, Dr. Rosensweet, dear, dear Dr. Rosensweet, as always, thank you. Thank you for everybody that came up. Have a beautiful, beautiful week. And we will talk then a week from today. Yes, we will. Bye-bye, everybody.